Hello my dears and welcome back to my corner of the internet. I'm Shannon and today I've got another book talk video to share with you guys. And today we are talking about Every Note Played by Lisa Genova. Lisa Genova is an author with a very interesting perspective in that she is also a neurologist. So she brings a very interesting take to the books that she writes. I've read one other book by Lisa and that one was called Still Alice. And it was about a woman who develops early onset Alzheimer's. And this one is about a man, a concert pianist, no less, who develops ALS. This book is hard to read at parts. There are a lot of parts that are uncomfortable. There are a lot of parts that are very, very sad but it's such an excellent story told so masterfully that no matter how uncomfortable you're feeling as you're reading about the really intense physical suffering that this man is going through as he slowly but surely loses control of his body, no matter how uncomfortable it gets, you just have to keep reading because it's that good. So this book is about Richard. As I said, he's a concert pianist. He's divorced. Um, he has a daughter who's 20 years old and in university. His ex-wife is a woman named Karina and she is also a musician. She, they, they went to school together um, where they were learning music and then um, she kind of shifted her focus over to jazz whereas Richard always kept his focus on classical music and it took off for him. He became a worldwide success, performing huge shows where he was just revered by many as a genius in his field. For Karina, after their child was born, she kind of let her career go by the wayside, mainly because Richard convinced her to move to Boston, which doesn't really have much of a jazz music scene. You know, cities with those kind of scenes are more like New York or New Orleans, whereas Boston just doesn't have it. But she makes the best of it, uh, but unfortunately over time their relationship collapses. Um, Richard spending more and more time on the road um, and devoting less and less time to his family. He starts having affairs. He's just not emotionally available for Karina or for their daughter Grace. So he gets his diagnosis. At first they thought it might have been tendonitis, but then it, it just keeps progressing and eventually he gets the ALS diagnosis. The first things to go are his hands, his arms and his hands. First one goes and then he kind of just um, shuffles his playing a bit and he just keeps playing with one hand. He lives alone in a home that has three flights of stairs and he knows that soon that's not going to work for him anymore. So once both of his arms are fully paralyzed, at this point he's getting um, daily care from a number of home care aides. One's named Bill, he comes in the morning. And then there's one that, a woman that comes in the afternoon and then somebody comes in the evening. But Bill's the one that Richard really forms a relationship with. They just really get along well together. Bill keeps things as normal as possible, keeps the mood light. And Richard really, really appreciates Bill and all that he does for him. While this is all going on, we start getting glimpses into Richard's past when he was a young boy. We learn that his mother died very young of cancer when Richard was about 19. And then his father has just kind of been a really dark figure in his life. They have no relationship. When Richard was a young boy and he put his focus into music, especially classical music, his father really wrote him for it and made him feel bad about his choice of interest. His father wished he played sports, but that was never a thing that Richard was interested in. So he grew up just really detached from his father, just a really strained relationship and they haven't spoken in years. Once Richard gets his diagnosis, he writes drafts of letters to his father that never get sent. He's got a file on his computer that's slowly filling with letters to his father where he tells his father that he's sick and um, explains what's going on. He never sends them 
mainly because he's a little afraid that he won't get a response. And um, knowing that you don't get a response from your father about such life-altering news, to him that's too much, that's, that's more than he could bear. So he never sends the letters. After a little while, Karina gets word of his diagnosis. She's in a bit of denial and she can't believe that this is happening to him. Finally, she goes over to visit him and sees the deterioration that has happened in just the few months since he got his diagnosis and she's very taken aback by it. One day, a few months later, Richard um, is in his home. Bill's getting ready to leave. Bill again is, is his morning home care aide. Bill's getting ready to leave and Richard says that he wants to take himself for a walk after Bill leaves. Bill doesn't love the idea of it because of course Richard cannot use his arms at all. Uh, but Richard tells him, you know, it's fine. I have a neighbor. She's home. She'll, she'll help me get into the house. But when he gets home, he can't get a hold of his neighbor. And while on the walk, he has a very difficult time just getting as far as the park that he used to walk to very easily. At this point, he wears his cell phone strapped to his chest that is voice activated. So he's trying to call the afternoon health care aide. But her name, the way he's trying to call her, the words he's saying, is very close to Karina, his ex-wife's name, and that's who ends up being called. And she says, don't worry, I'm in the city, I'm very close by, I'll be right there. Uh, while he's waiting, he has an accident. He, he really needs to use the washroom, but he can't hold it because all of his muscles are weakening and he has an accident. Karina comes and she lets him into the house and she cleans him up and she says, it's time for you to come home. Um, and he agrees because Richard has nobody else, you know, his father, that relationship's gone. He has brothers, but they kind of went with the father. You know, he doesn't have a relationship with any of them. And Karina knows this, so she says, I'm going to take you home and I will help you during the hours when the home care aides aren't there to help. So she sets up a room for him in her den with a hospital bed and um, they just kind of make the best of it. His health is rapidly deteriorating, but they're, with the technology that we have in this day and age, they're able to help him maintain a little bit of independence. Like, uh, he's able to still use his computer because I guess there's some sort of um, contraption where there's, you can put a dot on your forehead or on your nose and that works as a mouse. And so you can kind of move around the screen that way. And, so he keeps writing these letters to his father. Finally, he writes a ninth one and he feels good about it and he, he contemplates printing it. Um, eventually his daughter comes home for Christmas and when he divorced from Karina, Grace kind of took Karina's side and her and Richard haven't had much of a relationship and because of that, no one's told her yet what's going on with Richard at all. They haven't told her at all that he has ALS, let alone how much his body's deteriorated in about the year since she's seen him. Every time, it just didn't seem like the right time, like there, it was exam time or it was this or it was that. So eventually Karina calls her because she knows Grace is coming home for Christmas and she says, listen, your father's here because he lives here again now. And Grace is like, what? And she's like, yeah, he's, he's not feeling well, so we needed some help. And he's just living here for now. So Grace comes home very confused, and then she sees him, you know, and his arms are paralyzed. He's, his talking is difficult. His breathing is labored. And she's really taken aback, and she's really hurt that nobody thought to tell her. Um, so Christmas is awkward and it's weird and for everyone it's just a really weird time. And like I was saying, Richard has written this ninth and final letter to his father that he's feeling pretty satisfied with. So he um, he's really thinking about sending it and th thinking about his relationship with his father leads him to begin thinking about his relationship with his daughter and how he's been with a, as a father. And he starts to see that 
There are similarities between the way that he fathered and the way that his father fathered him. And he has this moment where he imagines, you know, his daughter writing a letter like this to him one day. And he's filled with a great sadness that um, there might not be time for them to reconcile and build a relationship. And he has this moment of realization where he realizes that not only did he cheat on his wife, he also cheated on his daughter in that there were days when she would have a recital or some event with the school, but he'd be on tour and he could have come home early, but you know, he was seeing a woman there and he didn't want to leave her. Um, and it all just builds up inside of him, all of the ways that he did his daughter wrong. And then also the realization that there's no time to fix it because he had always thought, you know, oh, well, down the road, down the road, we'll, we'll figure it out, we'll work it out, I'll make it up to her. And now the realization that that's not gonna happen is staring him right in the face. I guess this is where I'll give the spoiler warning. There's no big twists or turns. It's just kind of a progression to the end. Uh, but if you don't want to know how it ends, now would be the time to click off. I would so wholeheartedly recommend this book. It's beautifully written. Lisa Genova, she writes um, prose that is beautiful. And then it's also very raw and very real and she's brave with her writing. And there were some parts where I'd just kind of be like, oh, wow, that's, that's a brave move to write that and I appreciated it so much. But also, like I said, it's uncomfortable to read in parts, you know, but I think those are the books too that are so important to read. Um, they open your eyes and they make you feel things and it's... It's a very interesting story and it makes you realize and feel um, what this disease does to a body. So yeah, if you're staying for the rest, let's just get on into it. So shortly thereafter, while Richard is still going back and forth on the idea with whether he should send the letter to his father or not, Karina comes in and says that a phone call has come for him and it's his brother and Richard's kind of like what so she puts it on speakerphone and his brother tells Richard that their father has died and just like that <laughs> the should I or shouldn't I is done with it's been taken out of his hands he waits for the grief to come but it doesn't so he tells his brother that they'll be there, they'll be at the funeral. Um, at this point, he's having a lot of trouble speaking and his brother kind of picks up on it over the phone, but just kind of thinks that Richard's choked up because of the news he's just gotten, not that he can't speak. So they go to the funeral. Um, his brothers, you know, they're very taken aback by the condition that Richard is in. They have some misplaced ideas about what Richard should be doing to fight the disease more. Like um, one of his brothers said, you should go to the gym, you know, so you don't lose the, the muscle use in your legs. And of course, Richard in his mind is kind of like, that's not how it works. But, you know, he says, good idea. <laughs> like, what else are you supposed to say? He doesn't want to get into a fight with him about it. Um, and then his brothers tell him, they're like, you know, we want you to know that in dad's will, he left the house to just the two of us because he has two brothers. And Richard's kind of like, of course he did. And then the brother says, but we want you to know that we're actually going to be selling the house and splitting it three ways because you were also his son. And Richard is really, really touched by this. And um, he thanks them and the brothers express to him how sorry they were that his childhood was the way it was and how sorry they were that they were also too scared of their father to stick up for him. So he says, you know, that's what we're doing now. We're sticking up for you. And then that kind of ends and that's the last time Richard sees his brothers and it's a nice way to end that. So then they go home and it's shortly after that that Richard uh, takes a bit of a setback and he catches pneumonia. Um, there's a portion where Karina is gone 
for a little trip with one of her friends and Grace is in town looking after him during the hours when the home carries aren't there and he takes a fall and then he gets pneumonia and um, before this, before Karina is able to get away with her friend, she's going through a lot of resentment. You know, she wants to care for him because to her it's the right thing to do, but she's she's almost had enough. Like, he's not her husband anymore. She has no real obligation except for like the goodness of her heart that wants to keep caring for him. But it's it's so much and she's just about at her breaking point. So when she gets home, um, shortly after Richard has a bit of a situation where he's choking and can't breathe. And so she calls 911, he gets intubated and taken to the hospital. At which point the doctor there tells him that he's got two choices. Um, and at this point he can no longer speak. So the doctor says we can uh, intubate you, um, like with a tracheotomy, and then you would need 24-7, 365 days a year care, like top-notch top care. Um, or we can take it all out, send you home, and uh, basically you'll suffocate to death. And so the doctor says, sleep on it. Don't tell me right now. Sleep on it and let me know what you want to do. So the two of them, they spend a lot of time thinking about it. And Karina doesn't really offer any input. She wants it, you know, it's, a, it's a literally a life or death situation. So she wants him to make the entirety of the decision himself. And he's thinking about it and he's thinking about it and... The doctor told him that like if he gets intubated there's a good chance he could live for many 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 more years and he knows that that's that means that Karina's life will continue to come to a standstill basically because um, to get the kind to pay for the kind of care he would need it's four hundred thousand dollars a year or else someone who he knows would have to do it for him and that of course would be Karina. So finally he looks at it and he says, let me find a quote here. So here's kind of the conclusion he comes to. I'll read it to you. The doctor says, okay, I'll be back tomorrow. So we're 100% clear on the choices. Your choice is either to be extubated and most likely die, or you're getting the surgery and asking Karina to, to take care of you. 24 seven, you understand that these are your choices and the consequences of each. Richard blinks and doesn't look at Karina. He assumes she understands as well. It's either her life or his. And <laughs> he decides um, to give her back hers and he opts to not have the surgery, to be extubated and to go home. In the few days, um, leading up to his death because it takes a few days he stops being able to eat and he lasts about three days before he dies and um, he can't speak but at one point Bill the morning home care um, nurse comes in and says Karina has a surprise for you so he gets him up and gets him in the wheelchair and um, one of the things was when Bill left his home he left everything in it except for the things that he needed, but one of the things that was left there was his piano. And it's his piano that's been his for many, many years when he lived in the house with Karina when they were married. Um, you know, she says, this has always been his piano. I wasn't even allowed to play it when it lived in the house, even though she was a, you know, talented pianist as well. Um, so she has brought his piano to the house just so it's near him. Of course he can't play. He hasn't been able to play for a very long time, but she just wanted it to be near him. Um, and this touches him a lot. And um, he sort of motions for her to play it. And she says, what do you want me to play? And 
um, all of his favorite songs. It says all of his favorite songs spring immediately to mind. Uh, but then what he says to her, and he doesn't verbally say it, he, like, through the machine says it. But instead he asks her to play some jazz, uh, which she does, and it's while she's playing that he passes on. And perhaps one of the most beautiful things that could have happened from their time together at the end of his life is she uh, found a place where she could truly and honestly tell him that she forgave him. And uh, his daughter's there when he goes, and um, before he had ended up in the hospital, they had gotten to have a good talk where he said, you know, I'm sorry, uh, and I love you. And so he got to die as well and as peacefully as could be expected. So there you go, you guys. That is every note played by Lisa Genova. It, um, it hits you. It hits you real hard, right in the heart. And uh, it hit me harder than I thought it was going to, especially towards the end. The last, like, 50 pages, a lot of tears were shed. Um, so if you've read this, I'd love to hear what you thought. Um, or if you're interested in reading it, let me know that too. And next week, we're going to be talking about our second month book club selection. And that is The Great Alone by Kristen Hanna. Have you guys been reading? Uh, I'm about, I don't know, 100 pages in, and I am really, really, really loving it. Kristen Hanna's a great writer. So let me know if you're reading along for that. Can't wait to talk to you guys about it in the comments next week. So yeah, thanks so much for watching, you guys. If you like this video, please leave a like. I hope you'll subscribe. That helps me out so much. And I will see you on Monday. Bye, guys.